I'm going to turn you off just for a second. Okay. Um, I don't know why this is working. Okay. So what I had you do is just a little bit down. Scroll. A little bit down, and then that'll work. Okay, one more second. Okay. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> my name, like I, like she said, is Kim Chacon. Um, I am from UC Davis. I am in the geography graduate group as a PhD student. Um, just to give you an idea of where I come from, I actually have a background in landscape architecture and I also minored in environmental horticulture. So I'm a landscape architect that actually likes plants. <laughs> I promise. Um, I, I, in my senior year of landscape architecture at UC Davis, became involved in a pollinator planting bed with the UC Davis Arboretum. Um, and I was working with Ellen Zagary, and my little senior undergraduate brain became obsessed with the idea of how do I make this garden planting area the most perfect pollinator garden that's ever existed. And um, at the same time in the news, bees were all, all over the place. Bees are dying, they're having problems. And I thought, you know what? I'm one of the people that can help them. Um, and I thought, okay, how do I do this? <laughs> and as it turns out, it's actually pretty complicated, but I can tell you what I know and give you some ideas of how to go forward after you leave this room, okay? So, here we go. I'm gonna review a little bit of what Angela said too, just so you know. So the main problem, just in case you have not heard, is that bees are having problems. Um, there are less bees now than there were in the past. Um, in the picture, we have a, I don't have a pointer? Do I have a pointer? Uh, yeah, that does have a pointer. Yay! Yeah, I still can point. Yeah. Um, so this is a bee that you probably have seen. This is what you think of when you see a bee. You think of a European honeybee, who actually isn't native at all. <laughs> not to California, not to the US. But we use European honeybees for our food. They're really good at helping us pollinate crops and make our food. Okay, very important. Um, they are the ones, when you hear in the news, bees are having problems, colony collapse disorder, it's these. They're actually the weird ones, just so you know, okay? They have hives. They live socially. They're a lot different than most bees, and we'll get into that, okay? Um, when you hear that bees are having problems, and you hear about colony collapse disorder, know that colony collapse disorder is actually uh, multiple issues working in together in a bad way. Um, in the most recent um, bee symposiums that I've been to in Davis, they are concentrating on studying pesticides and the effects that those have on bees. And specifically, when you have pesticides and fungicides, those working together creates a very bad synergy. Um, one thing that has come up in the last two years, finally, is measuring the lethal dose of pesticide versus the tolerated dose of pesticide, et cetera. So know that scientists are looking into these exposures and tolerances uh, for bees, but it's only recently that that's been going on, okay? Um, and also know that when you read studies about these things, it's most of the research by far is done on European honeybee, okay? Um, know that there are thousands of other types of bees. And they are native to this area. Um, they are native to North America. They are native bees all around the world. We're gonna talk about the ones in California today. Yay. I will. <laughs> so um, notice also that you don't really hear a lot about native bees in the research, um, and that's the funding issue. Native bees, in, in people's minds, and the people who have funding, are our conservation issue. Um, in reality, it's bigger than that. Native bees provide pollination for plants and, and provide homes for other animals as well. And so it's actually a biodiversity issue. But if you're a researcher studying bees, you're gonna get your funding if you're studying agricultural bees and not native bees, okay? <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you that from the perspective of someone who studies native bees. So not very much funding out there for me. But that's okay, I wanna figure it out. So um, just so you know, if these European honeybees Keep, continue to have problems, what are some of the things we can do? Well, we can try to breed stronger European honeybees. People are doing that. We can try to use less pesticides. That would be great. Um, 
we can try to you know, take care of the mite issues, the virus issues that are going on, and, and take care of that. Well, the major you know, other opportunity is to rely more on our actual California native bees. So let's take a look at who those are. Um, bees are essential, and as Angela mentioned, they are the most productive pollinators. Um, there are a few different reasons for that, um, one of which is that they have, they're very furry, they're very hairy, um, and the, if it doesn't have a label, this is a photo that I have taken myself, so you can see how fuzzy that little creature is right there. Um, they have branched hairs as well, so pollen sticks to them very well. They're like little balls of Velcro flying around <laughs> and getting covered up. Um, Another interesting thing when you read the papers on bees is that habitat fragmentation is always mentioned as a major problem for the bee populations, and yet the solutions, as a landscape architecture student, I found very limiting. You know, it was like, okay, you can make um, you know, pollinator garden over here, and one over there, and yeah, try your best, right? And it's like, oh, come on, and we, we can do better than that. We can have some strategy, right? Um, how far apart are they supposed to be? How close together are they supposed to be? Like these are all really good questions to start asking and getting into. And um, yeah, well, well, we will get into it. Um, but if you're saying that there is a spatial problem, you need to come up with a spatial solution, right? Yes. So um, to stabilize ecosystem services, a lot of times just, you know, people call um, pollination ecosystem services. That is something that nature does for humans, you could think about it in a human-centric way, for free, <laughs> okay? Bees are out there pollinating. Um, we don't have to go outside with paintbrushes and touch flower to flower. Believe it or not, there are some parts of the world, I will not name names, where that is happening right now. Because they want cherries or apples or whatever and they kill all the bees. So we don't want to be like that, okay? We can do better and you guys are gonna help. <laughs> So who are the bees? Because this is a good question. Um, and most of you, since you're gardeners, you've probably seen them. You may not know who they are quite yet, but coming out of here, I hope you have a better idea. Um, so just so you have an idea, and these are sorted by name, um, like taxonomic levels. So honeybees, so this is a European honeybee. No, so this one's European, and everybody else on here is a native bee, <laughs> okay? Um, so in the world, there's about 20,000 species, which is amazing. Um, they have an amazing diversity. In North America, about 4,000. In California, it's somewhere between 2,000 and 1,600. Let's keep counting, okay? We'll figure it out better. Um, in California, according to Gordon Frankie's books, there are about 17 genera and about 46 species, which are common throughout the whole of California. Um, and that's interesting because we have so many different ecological types in, in California. Um, in Davis, when I talked to Robin Thorpe, who has since passed, thank you Robin for your help, but um, he had seen in Davis commonly 21 to 26 genera, and that results in, that trickles down to 58 or 72 species in Davis, and he was still counting when I talked to him, so I'll have to see what the final numbers are sometime soon, I'll we'll set by the bee biology. Um, you've probably seen in your gardens these really big ones. These are Xylocopa. They're, uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the life histories now because there are different styles. So some bees tunnel into wood, um, and these are them. So if you have those darn bees that are getting into your siding <laughs> or your deck or whatever, it's, it's the carpenter bees. Yeah, the Xylocopa. They're very large. Um, you've probably come face to face with one <laughs> at least once. Um, if you've seen the black ones, those are the females, and the golden ones like this are the males. Um, interestingly, the males, although they will stare at you and they will like get close to you and posture, they don't even have a stinger. <laughs> so it's, it's all show. <laughs> um, and that actually goes for all of the native bees as well. They, the males do not have stingers, um, the females do, but they're, unless you provoke them, like you're not gonna gets done. Just to give you an idea of how more, much more calm they are than, you know, our little different friend up here. Um, the entire time I did my field work, like for one year straight, I was just outside looking at bees. Um, I never got stung. <laughs> never. Okay. And it's just as long as you're just there and observant and not like stepping on them or grabbing them with your bare hands, you'll be fine. Okay. Um, 
We also have uh, another one in the same family, uh, bumblebees. They're some of the first ones to come out in the spring. They're so furry. I'm sure you've seen them around. Um, they are kind of cute, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to think these are cute at the end. Could you bring the mic closer to you? Sorry. I'll hold it. How about that? Yes. yes.
California, the Andrina that live there only feed off of uh, Lastinia, the gold fields. So it's called an obligate relationship. It's a one-to-one -one relationship between bee and flower. Um, but most bees, which are commonly found in California, not the rare ones, are generalists. So they are more willing to eat off of different flowers. Um, so range. So I mentioned earlier that females um, are tied to the nest, basically. I mean, not physically, but their goal is to raise they're young. They, well, they don't raise the young. They lay the eggs. They provide the provisions for the young to grow. Okay. How it works is the female uh, creates a pollen ball in the bottom of the nest or at the end of the nesting tube and um, lays an egg on top and seals off the chamber and repeats that over and over again until it gets closer to the exit point. Okay. Um, and like I said, the females are busy doing this for pretty much their whole life. Okay. Um, so the females are bound to their nest, whether it be in the ground or in hollow stem, right? That kind of thing. Um, so only the honeybee, only European honeybee, not native, can go really far. Can travel up to two miles from their home. Um, in second place, we have bombus and xylophopha. You know, they're big bees. Um, their range is related to their body size, which has been proven. Um, most native bees have a range of about a quarter mile from their nest, okay? Keep in mind, this is the female um, side of things, but that's how limited they are in general um, from their uh, nest. I'm reminded right now that that doesn't apply to the males, so my research mostly applies to the females and thinking about habitat restriction for them. Um, so this gets me started on uh, a little bit more of their biology. So in my research, I created, um, well, I, I gathered a lot of sources from uh, the Xerxes Society book, Attracting Native Pollinators, and also from a book called uh, California Bees and Blooms by Gordon Frankie and Robin Clark. And I compiled information about which bees feed on what in a giant spreadsheet. <laughs> so I went from, you know, designing gardens to really working in spreadsheets a lot all of a sudden. So here we go. So what I did is, um, the idea was to make a matrix of the favorite plants per each bee genus. So it was like this. So for example, they found bombus a lot on aster, and they found bombus on shinus. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like, wow. it's a really big matrix. Um, and I know you can't read that, and I'm sorry, but I just wanted to give you an idea <laughs> that this was like a lot of little X's. Um, for a trend, so I'm just going to tell you because I know you can't read it, but the one with the most X's is European honeybees. And right below that is Bombus, which is bumblebees. Um, and you can see that they are also really good generalists. Um, so. Also, some of them only have like one X, for example, so you know, like one or two things. And I thought, you know what, since this information is published, how do we apply this knowledge? Um, well, I'll get to that. <laughs> we tried to apply that knowledge to a mammalian or a more charismatic animal model, okay? Um, so just to sum it up, most bees live alone, okay? Um, they forage off of a menu of favorite plants, so they have preferences, although some have bigger menus than others. and. Um, most of them, on average, travel up to about a quarter mile uh, radius from the nest. And um, remember that most of them live in the ground, okay? So bee habitat needs. Um, these are things that you guys can all do. <laughs> Let's just translate um, this, because I started off with this. Um, bee habitat needs. They have preferred plants that they forage from. Um, the flowering blooms that you are providing them need to be available at the time that the bees are available, because bees also have seasons. Ha! Ah, let's just add that in there. It's even more tricky um, than just gardening. You have to actually think about the bees' cycles as well. Um, bees have also preferred materials for nesting. So like I said, some of them like pithy stems, um, and other ones like bare earth. So, you know, I like mulch a lot too, but give them, <laughs> give them a little space, pull the mulch back in places, uh, because they need that in order to create their nests. 
Um, also, something that's missing, because habitat fragmentation, right? That was cited in the beginning a lot. Um, well, we need adequate proximity between the habitat patches. So, you know, as a gardener, it's like you want to respond exactly to that, right? <laughs> that sounds easy enough, yeah? Yeah? No? No. No. Ten years in grad school? No. <laughs> so, um, and, and basically, where we went with this grad school model is um, what's been going on with more charismatic animals um, since the 80s. There's been uh, urban ecology and landscape ecology as a field, but applying those um, methodologies and ideologies to bees was actually really tricky. But here was the goal, okay? Um, we wanted to define and understand understand habitat fragmentation, because we kept reading about this habitat fragmentation, but what exactly defies, you know, defines fragmentation? Is it in time, or space, or both? And oh gosh, there's a lot of different types of bees. Um, how do we strategically solve it? Um, so we thought, okay, how do we do this? Because if it's a spatial problem, we need a spatial answer. Well, we need to use maps, hence geography, right? Um, so these are like the more nitty gritty, you know, keyword kind of things for the research side of things. Um, you know, ultimately it's like, yeah, I want to make a great pollinator garden. Um, well, what does that mean specifically, scientifically? Um, I need to reduce the spatial bottleneck, um, and I also need to make sure that um, I'm getting as many bees in the landscape as possible. Um, and let's see, increase the quality of quality. You guys get that. So um, this got broken down into kind of four papers, more or less. Um, so you can think about it like that. There was the phenology mapping. So we created a model which in included uh, bloom time for plants and also for bees. Um, well, not their bloom, but their emergence times. And um, we looked at how closely they were using where they would be predicted to go versus where they were actually were, um, which was super interesting. Uh, that's the type of study that people do with um, more charismatic animals on, but we're finally getting to bees, you know. They're just not as cute as the butterfly, right? right? Not the green butterfly. Not true. But we do have green bees, right? So. <laughs> um, and then finally, because there's this side of me that is really interested in how do I apply this knowledge like to the max? Like, okay, if I'm gonna be a bee designer, like how do I slather bees like everywhere? Um, so, so here we go. <laughs> So this is a map um, in the UC Davis Arboretum. This is my study site. Um, it was supposedly supposed to be in the beginning uh, just one of the chapters, but oh my goodness, let me tell you, <laughs> there's a lot to do here. So this is um, one of my lab mates was lucky enough. Um, his research revolved around mapping every single plant in the UC Davis Arboretum. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Um, his name's Brian Morgan, by the way. He's really nice. Um, but yeah, this is the result of his uh, working for many years on that. Um, every single plant is linked to a database, um, and so you can query where is, you know, whatever you want to find, California poppy, and it'll pop up, um, and it has the records for where that plant came from, and that sort of thing. Interestingly, as an undergrad, guess who worked on the database? <laughs> so I already knew really well, you know, I was accustomed to how the database worked, the limitations, what type of information was in there, which was super lucky for me. It just, yeah. Um, just so you know, in the field of uh, landscape ecology, um, it's a newer field in general, as far as giving urban landscapes credit for having ecological benefit. Um, so people call it um, like an urban ecosystem. Um, there's been a new phrase that's been used where it's called a novel ecosystem. Has anybody read Emma Morris? Rambunctious gardens. Yeah. Okay, I'll write it on the board afterwards. Um, amazing book, very inspiring, um, but talking about how even urban areas or compromised areas, areas that aren't wild or perfect, um, still having some functionality and where to go from there. So, good inspiration for me, <laughs> hopefully for you too. Um, but basically, if, you, if I was to sum up um, our landscape ecology class in a couple um, quick sentences, um, you have like an urban matrix, so that's the predominant land cover. So imagine this is San Francisco buildings, okay? And then you have the habitat patches, right? Which are the little um, gardens left, or the wild patches left, where the green butterflies were living, right? It's like that. 
Um, but these type of patterns, you could imagine imposing like these type of um, framework of thinking in our normal urban areas, but also our suburban areas, um, which actually have you know a fair amount of trees and, and gardens. Thank you, um, and hopefully more in the future. So they're new. Uh, but how do these systems function for bees? Um, we got really interested in the suburban landscape, and unfortunately, that was too complicated, and we had to give up. Um, but I would like to continue there if I can. Um, so this is how um, it works for animals, the more sexy animals. Um, in California, we have a wonderful uh, database um, from Fish and Wildlife, and you can look up, if you're a designer, you can look up which amphibians live in the county where I'm going to design. Which reptiles live there? What's their status? Can you hunt them? Are they endangered? Are they threatened, federally threatened? California endangered? All of those different statuses and what they need are listed on here. The basic idea for larger animal conservation is that if you build it, they will come. So if you build the garden that they, with the plants that they like, then they will be there, okay? So we thought, okay, can we apply that to bees? How, well, or how predictable are they? Can we do this? So um, our goal was to test, and you can see, that I know this is hard to read too, but this is the map in the arboretum <laughs> of the different plants that are in there. You can see how much they pack into a garden. Um, and we wanted to see, you know, if I know um, California poppy is there, do, am I gonna see the bees that would visit it? Um, know that in the arboretum, um, this is a rare environment, right, that there would be a fully mapped like ecosystem. Um, so this was a great study area for me. Um, there are 15,000 plants. <laughs> Some of those are repeated uh, species-wise, but um, yeah, fully mapped. Good model to start testing um, bee and flower associations. That's what it's called, the feeding association, okay? So let's see where the gaps are. Um, this is just another style. If you haven't used GIS, this is what the map looks like when you bring it up. Lots of labels. Um, it's easier said than done, okay? And I got stuck here for a while. Um, if you're gonna do a similar study, I can help you figure out how to get it done. <laughs> Through trial and error, <laughs> I figured it out. Um, so basically, I had to decide at which level to work at. Normally, normally, uh, for bigger animals, you would decide on an animal species, and you would work with plant species that you know about. But with bees, oh goodness, you cannot tell them apart to the species level in the field. Ah, in fact, they're, they're hard to tell apart even to the genus level in the field. Um, but I worked really hard to do that, and I became familiar with the ones in my area, okay? Um, it took practice, and I went to a course in Arizona called the B course, which if you can go, go. Angela and I went there, it was great. Um, long story short, I had a map of the arboretum's plants too, but I could not necessarily identify them to the species level in the field, right? Especially in the arboretum, they have a lot of special cultivars and varieties and that sort of thing. And I suddenly realized, I tried doing this on multiple years, and I realized that I could only go to a certain level ID-wise in the field because of the volume of bees that I was seeing. And I'll explain that again. So I had to make compromises. I ended up going with bee and flower genus level. Uh, ID, okay? Um, let's see. Do that. Um, we had to figure out if it was possible to even map how much bee visitation we were seeing, and so I ended up coming up with a solution for that as well. Um, and also, when I was doing the testing, if you go out and look at bees every month or so, you're actually not gonna see all of the turnover. I realized that I had to go weekly in order to see the, the trends um, of visit visitation because the bee lives are so short and also because flowering can turn on and off so fast in our area. So for example, redbud in Davis flowers for like two weeks, that's it. So if I only went out once a month, I may not catch all of the, the bees on that. Um, know how tricky the idea is, just so you know. Um, in the United States, there is I would say one person left, maybe two people, who can ID actually down to the species level. That's how complicated it is. Um, they look at details, um, highly trained entomologists, and they look at details such as uh, angles of the wing veins and other details like that. Um, so, you know, I've gotten myself down to about the genus level, but it takes practice to get more than that. 
a lot of experience. Just to give you an idea of scale, how small some of these little bees are. This is a Hylaeus bee, so a masked bee. And this is on Datura, which is, of course, a big flower. But isn't that an amusing picture to see how small they are? If you look really close, they have little yellow lines in the front of their face, which is why they're called masked bees. Um, the other challenging part, just so you know, was to figure out if I have a bee um, on the page, you know, and I record it, you know, do I try to record all the bees on the trip or not? Well, I'll tell you what I decided. Um, in the end, what I decided to do was weekly walks. I would walk the entire arboretum, which is composed of about 35 gardens. I can't remember, I think it's 30, maybe 34. Um, I would look for a unique bee and flower association. So again, that's feeding, and I would look per garden. So I was using the garden as my uh, spatial unit. Um, and I, all I was doing was looking for a feeding association within that garden. So for example, maybe in the Mary Wattis Brown Garden, I would look for xylococa feeding on uh, stercis. And I'd write it in my notebook <laughs> and keep on going. Um, it was very fast. These are very, very fast little creatures. And at the time, too, I, I wanted to record what I was doing, um, partially also for ID, because IDing the plants and the flowers is, is both tricky, OK? I consider myself to be pretty good at plant ID, but like you know, the arboretum is a, is a special place for plants, right? Um, so what I did is I took a picture with every association that I saw. And I had to get really good at taking pictures. This also took years to practice. You can see in my camera, you have to have a really good macro lens in order to take good pictures of them. Um, but I have a record of every um, bee and flower. Sometimes I didn't always get them feeding, right? Sometimes the bees were too fast and they went away. But I at least took a picture of that spot. Why would I do that? Well, as it turns out, you can combine photography and you can add coordinates to it pretty simply nowadays, okay? If you want to do this, you can totally do it on your own. You can use your phone to record the coordinates of where you're walking. Um, I used an app called Geophotos Pro. Maybe there's better ones by now. Um, working with the timestamps on the camera and my phone, it's able to assign coordinates to every single photo that I took. Okay? So when I get home, I can upload my photos. I run the, the app, Geophoto Tag Pro, and all of my uh, photos have coordinates now. So that's how I was able to get my data points into the maps, and they're all photographs. So I can click on it and double check the ID as I go. And I'll, I hope to upload them also to like a iNaturalist or something like that once I've graduated. <laughs> so um, note also, if you decide to do this type of work, you will need an insect net, okay? I can show you how to do that. It's best to go down or up if you're swinging. I should have brought one today so we could go hunting in the parking lot, but um, <laughs> next time. Um, Netting was done. Um, whenever I saw something that was new, whenever I saw the bee that was new to me, I would try to net that bee. And that's so that I could make sure and confirm the ID um, of that bee in the lab, okay? Because you do need a microscope in order to really get the details in there to be able to see them. Um, I became very, uh, through practice, um, good at identifying the bees that are in my area because I know who's supposed to be there um, and just through practice, okay? Um, so if you decide to do this type of thing, you know, if you learn plant names and you can ID plants, you can ID bees, okay? They're just like the, think of them like the analogous like counterparts to your plants. So I observed the associations. Now, when I went home also, I had these associations written down in a notebook and I transcribed them later to an Excel sheet. I know that sounds really exciting. But basically, it was like a more advanced version of Art Shapiro's um, butterfly research as far as how he recorded his um, butterfly occurrences in the field. Um, but I have um, photos and I also have um, coordinates for my, all of my data points. So how does this look? Oh, I know, it's another Excel sheet. It's so exciting. Trust me, I went from coloring trees to an Excel sheet too. So um, data of the, here's how I broke it down. Data of sighting, a walk number. So for example, walk number one, I only saw two bees the whole time in the arboretum. Um, I put the garden name um, and the plant that they were on. Sometimes, in the beginning especially, I was really excited because I could figure out exactly which species it was. <laughs> I had to give up on that around March. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I put the, the bee type um, and the genus. And uh, the photo number, because I have a photo for every single one. Sometimes without the bee, but that's okay. And that's just 
a um, summarized version for each walk. Um, as I went along further in the season, um, around June, especially um, May, June, it became very difficult to do the volume of work of what I was seeing out there. So what I had to do was I split the walk in between days. Um, and in the most busy time of year, the most busy weeks, it would take me three days to complete the entire walk around the Arboretum, um, as opposed to like two hours in January. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. So results, right? Here's the more exciting part. Um, I saw bees every single week in the Arboretum, every single week. Here's um, the week numbers are down here at the bottom. I didn't quite do 52 because I got interrupted, it's a long story. But I saw bees every single week, even in January, even when we had big storms on other days in the week. I would try to go on the most fair weather day of the week, so I wouldn't go out when it was actually storming, you know, like the next day. Um, you can see where the, this is the total uh, association of bee and flower visitation. You can see it peaks. Um, at the end of May, um, it peaked up to 439 um, associations seen uh, for that week. Yeah, because because it's the heating, it's heating up exactly. Um, just so you get an idea of how the gardens compared and how the different bees compared. So this is um, over months. Um, number of gardens with sightings was surprisingly. Um, stable, which surprised me, because I thought that maybe there would be kind of a buildup, but no, the bees traded off depending on what was available in time and space. Um, and you can see the number of plant genus with bees um, also peaks in May. So the most uh, foraging on different plants or the most available foraging plants are available in May, depending on how you look at it. Um, the number of bees foraging, uh, the genera, uh, peaks in May as well. Um, but it stays kind of stable between May and August, um, which is interesting. Um, so here are the genera that you may find in your garden locally here. Um, let's see. The ones with an asterisk, that means I saw probably one or two of them, so maybe don't expect those ones so much. Those were relatively rare in Davis. Um, Agapostamin, I saw a lot of them. They're green bees, Andrina. Uh, live in the ground, saw plenty of those. And Fidelum, I saw, saw a lot of. So you have probably seen a lot of these. Um, these are cactus bees, if you're not familiar with the different types. Um, if you want, take a picture, I don't mind. You can look them up. Um, okay, and then importantly, because remember, the whole goal of this was that I wanted to know how to make the best bee garden possible. Um, so I said, okay, which, I was comparing which gardens were which, and I know it's kind of hard to sort it out, so I put the chart on the bottom too. Um, these are the best gardens um, out of the Arboretum. They have values of 150 visits or more. Um, and then there's two high peaks here, which became of interest to me especially, um, because that means that there's two gardens that are like significantly better than the rest. Okay, so who are the winners? It's gonna be suspenseful, right? This was like eight years to coming up to this expensive part, right? <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's the big results, okay? Um, which I find interesting. So as the native plant lovers that you are here, there's a fly on my head, the main front winner in May is none other than the Mary Wattis Brown Native Garden. <laughs> Yay! Right? Um, wait a minute, who's this red one? <laughs> Get your pitchforks. I know where. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Don't get your pitchforks. Um, no, but there was a surprise to me, uh, which I was interested in. And, and just, I'm going to go back one so you can see. Do you see how much higher these two gardens are than the rest are? Um, the native garden is way better than the vast majority of them, except for that dark red one. But you can see how the the, here, the native garden peaks out earlier than the red one. So this is red one. <coughs> not native oh, plants. No. <gasps> that does not fit. <laughs> um, but it does fit with what the earlier speaker just said, Liam. He said that these are opportunistic insects, and guess what? 
bees are thinking the same as butterflies in that respect. Um, if they see food, they're going to go after it, okay? So who are these non-native plants? This is the store garden. Does anybody know that one? What is it supposed to? Oh, goodness. Okay. So the Ruth store garden is um, based on a program that the Arboretum made called the Arboretum All-Stars. And the Arboretum All-Stars are plants which were chosen because they are drought tolerant and they are beautiful. <laughs> okay? Um, and it turns out that we are not the only ones that think that they're beautiful. Bees also are attracted to those flowers. Um, it's not just that the flowers are beautiful, it's also that they're long blooming. All of those plants were field tested and they chose plants which did well in our area and bloomed a really long time. Now, I'm going to remind you before you get your pitchfork too close, is that, <laughs> <laughs> and I also like native plants a lot, I'm just going to say that. I think Mary West Brown Garden is my favorite garden in the Arboretum. But the non-native plants, those all-stars, are also really great. Um, what this is showing though, this chart shows, and what it doesn't show, this chart shows feeding preferences, right? Feeding preferences of bees, you know, later in the season. What it's not showing is all of the other benefits that native plants can give, right? Yeah, yeah it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> We're still friends. <laughs> so, I'm just saying that um, we have a non-native garden that's providing some habitat, okay? Um, for native bees. And remember how I said there's different seasons of bees? There's different seasons of bees. So the native garden is providing the early season bees with really, really good habitat, okay? Unbeatable, right? Um, and then later in the summer, we're getting a boost for our late summer bees, our longhorn bees, Melisoides, Vastra, um, are being fed with the, the all-star plants, which are of different geographic origin. They're from Mediterranean area, some are from Australia, etc. So, um, characteristics, both gardens are drought tolerant. Um, both have long bloom times, I, I, in my opinion. Although the California native garden peaks earlier in the season. Um, one thing I did notice in the Mary Wattis Brown Garden, and that, you know, it's a little anecdotal, but there were areas with tree cover, and then those blooms that were underneath it would persist longer in the season. And I think that that is a really good um, idea when you're creating um, these gardens is that if you have a hierarchy and you have things that can persist later into the season, you're going to be more helpful with your native gardens than if you only have one that's going to peak in May, okay? Um, so, Ruth Store Garden. They're both beautiful, just for uh, research results. Um, I know this is hard to read, so I have it in a table, but I wanted to show it like this so that you can see the drastic difference with what the best plant is. Um, so the best plant out of, so let's see, I had 7,700 unique um, Vita Flower Association events, um, composed of 303 genera, apparently. So these genera are re, you know, reused, if you can think about it, uh, over time. By far the best, just to show you how much bigger. Uh, this is salvia. Yeah! Um, right at the front there. Um, Aragonium is Number two there. Yeah, good for butterflies and for bees. Um, next is Ascholtia, which kind of surprised me. But there they are. So let's let's go to the next slide so you can read these better. And these are just the top 100, just to keep that in mind. Um, and if you want to use these, you know, take pictures, okay? Um, and just give me credit if you put it someplace. Um, so you can see the numbers there. It's a little easier to read like this. Um, green is the, the highest rated, and then the columns go lower rated, you can see down there, there were only 11 instances, for example, with mimosa, which is more than I would expect, but um, So, plenty of natives in there. I did not mark them native or non-native, because I figured you guys were coming from different parts in California, and, you know, what's a native up here might be different down south. I didn't want to get into that debate, so they just listed horticultural native plants together. Um, you can duke it out later with what you want to argue about for native or non-native. But you can see which ones are best for bees and which are not. Um, there were some surprisers. Um, so for example, ones that were not in the model um, was Heliotrochum, for example. Um, and that was not listed as a bee plant in either of the resources that I used to build my model. Um, but what an excellent plant. Um, and you can decide, 
what I would suggest as a gardener is that you pick um, species that grow well locally, okay? And have prolific blooms and that bloom for a long time. Of these uh, genera. And also, if you want to see little bees outside, I can show you afterwards, but the, it's not looking there. Uh, Aaron, when I'm outside, I saw um, Lassia blossom on that. Okay, so just to show you some more really fun in Excel. Um, <laughs> oh man, this was the whole summer, um, two summers ago, where in my model I added um, plant bloom types because I realized that the bloom time for plants was super important. So let's see, how much time do we have? You got 15 minutes. 15 minutes, okay. So I'm going to show you a series of maps and the magic that GIS can do um, by making a model. Um, basically what I did is for every single plant in the Arboretum, all 15,000 of them, I looked up when they start blooming, when they end. And sometimes I had to put an average depending on whatever Cal Forest said or Sunset said or whatever. So in the model, it works like this. You have a zero or you have a one, an X depending on when they're blooming. So they, this one, for example, starts in June and ends in uh, September. Went through. I even did the conifers because I wasn't quite sure what to do. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this is the kind of result that can happen uh, when you're doing these B niche analysis. Um, so the background is the map of the arboretum. Um, each blue or green dot is a plant that this particular bee should like. Um, and the red dots are where I actually saw the bees of that genus. So you can see that they use a much smaller percentage of the area that you would expect them to be in, um, at least this particular um, genera. So basically we made this model for all the, um, I don't want to say popular, all the common um, bee genera in California that we would expect, and then I had to verify them in site. Um, which took practice. So um, I don't normally kill insects or organisms, but here I did. Um, I collected them so that I could ID them positively, and these are all different individuals um, that I saw in the Arboretum. And these are in uh, chronological order. So these are early spring bees going all the way down to the um, late summer and fall bees. Um, what happens with this mapping? Well, I know these are hard to read, but I wanted to give you an idea of what these silly scientific study maps look like. So this is a map of a whole year of where I might expect to see Agapostomin. So January, February, March, April, May, June, get it? We get down here in November, nothing. Wow. December, nothing. Um, these are actual Agapostomin I saw in the field. So we're supposed to, I haven't put in all the results for the data points yet on my map. Um, and just to give you an idea, Agapostomin has a smaller radius that it travels, as opposed to Andrina, which has a larger possible range from its um, nest. And you can see with Andrina, Andrina's only missing um, possibly November. And the habitat's fairly well uh, connected throughout. Andrina's pretty happy because it eats a lot of different flowers and it's not so picky. Uh, Coletti's, on the other hand, um, no habitat in early spring or in winter, and hardly anything throughout the year. And guess what? I didn't see any during my whole research project. Um, Eustra. So this one, I actually have some data put in so that you can see an example. Um, this is for the whole year, so you can see you would maybe expect to uh, January, February, March it should be there, April, May, June, right? Fading off, nothing November, December. Um, well, here's a close-up of what those maps look like for USRA. So um, January, February, March, you can see where there's a gap. We should put some more plants in the middle here that uh, USRA likes. Um, but gosh, lo and behold, uh, April comes around, and maybe there is one there after all. Uh, and I haven't put in the data for that yet. I should mention that I just work on my own. I don't have a team. <laughs> so if anybody would like to enter data or be an intern. <laughs> um, um, here's Osmia. Osmia, these ones are adorable, and they just they're like little green, clumsy, round bees. Um, just to give you more idea. And just to give you an idea, this is a xylocopa. Xylocopa can uh, travel further. It has a one mile radius from the nest, in theory. Um, the ma females on the bottom, all black, the males on the top.
not all told them. And you can see that their habitat, I don't think they really would suffer from gaps in time and space for fragmentation. Um, so is that any recommendations? How much time do you have? Yep, like 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, good. So habitat recommendations. So in landscape ecology, um, we talk about things like linkages or corridors. Um, there's a whole field now, corridor ecology. Um, we talk about making stepping stones so that um, your beautiful green butterflies can get from one patch of land to another. Um, the technical words for that are matrix and circuitry and connectivity and stuff like that. Um, and increased urban habitat quality. So you can think about stepping stones like this. Um, you know, getting from one page, can you see my cursor? Cool. You can see getting from one um, big patch, you know, with little ones all the way across. And the more options you have for crossing, that's called circuitry, okay? So it's not just one uh, path, you can have multiple paths. Um, and you can think about any background between this. You know, maybe you're someone who studies birds and this is a forest, right? And this is like an agricultural area. Or maybe this is San Francisco. And you have like the Presidio over here, and you have Golden Gate Park over here. And um, we started thinking about, you know, where do we test these um, theories, these habitat matrix, and how do we apply them? And I told you we tried the suburbs thing, and that was actually really hard. It was really hard to study the backyards um, because of privacy issues and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> a number of different issues with that, um, and the resolution again because plants uh, these visit these little tiny plants, right? Like one plant could be as big as my hand, right? And then how do I record that on the map, which is at least a quarter mile in diameter from there. So it gets really tricky really fast. Well, <laughs> we thought, okay, the most extreme example, let's try San Francisco. Um, and it turns out that someone, uh, well, a nonprofit group has mapped every single tree in San Francisco. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so we started to do these um, kind of preliminary analyses, um, looking at just distance. And this is just to give you an idea of what's possible. And I did not end up finishing this chapter for my dissertation because our freedom study ended up being like, I want to say crazy, but it was, it was enough. Okay. Um, but this is an idea of what you can do in GIS. So we identified all the open space areas in the city, and then you can apply um, analysis tools to look at how far they are distance-wise from each other. So um, the map on the left is just open space with just the green, um, and then you can apply these distance analyses features, um, which we also included green roofs, so that's why you'll see the occasional like green speck in there. Um, but you can see all that would target like all of these red areas to those areas would need uh, more habitat for bees. Um, but again, looking at the plant level, right, like that resolution versus like the whole city re resolution is very difficult, if not impossible. So um, I do have ideas for that. Uh, I'll be graduating in June 2020. <laughs> um, but um, I do have some ideas of how to tackle that, but it just ended up being too much for my actual dissertation. So um, just to kind of start wrapping things up, know that even in the Arboretum, a very artificial environment, basically a plant zoo, right? There is urban ecology going on right now. Um, I saw the emergence of different bees at different times in the year. And I saw how that corresponded with flowering and phenology. I saw uh, a whole suite of species. Look at all of these different um, bees. I even saw some pretty rare ones. Um, I was very lucky to find them. Robin Thorpe was very generous to give me his time and help me ID them. Um, I hope that you can appreciate how adorable those long horns are now, or how cute it is, those little spots on the abdomen, and uh, how weird that European honeybee is. <laughs> I mean, I even gave them nicknames in the, when I didn't know all of their scientific names yet, and probably you did this with plants, but for example, this one I call cute gray. It's so cute. <laughs> Um, and I also saw, if you see this, this is called a long-legged bee fly. 
And just to be clear, that's a fly. <laughs> um, they look hilarious. They look very clumsy and the legs just kind of drag. But I saw all of those type of ecosystem characters um, in this urban gardens, uh, which was really fantastic and interesting to watch. Um, designing for bees, this is where things get really, really exciting. Um, and basically, if I was in charge, we would just have plants everywhere. Um, if you can offset, if, as a gardener, I think one of the major goals is to offset anything that's paved, anything that's a roof, that is just, um, you know, instead of being planted or ecologically beneficial, it's just taking up space and creating gaps. So if you can try to solve those gaps um, of paving and that sort of thing and make them yeah. into places with plants, I think it's really best. Um, keep in mind from a bee's perspective, you know, a leak um, is also a habitat gap, uh, for example. Um, so try to avoid those types of things. You have to put on your bee glasses in order to design for bees. Um, try your best to reduce the spatial bottlenecks. Keep in mind that when you make a bee garden, you know, over here, that you should probably also try to make some stepping stones throughout your city to the next bee garden. That's what's really best um, and beneficial ecologically. Um, if you can deliver your message through, you know, smart design, clever design, um, I can help you. <laughs> Um, have some ideas for that. I think that you should try to plan with your local conditions. So before you actually do a bee design in your area, you should probably do some field work and pay attention to who's there already. Um, see who's missing, that sort of thing. Um, and above all, explore and celebrate the local diversity in your area. So you could make a design that is good for two really different type of bees. It would be probably really interesting for little kids to see that, like juxtaposed, I think. Um, you know, teach little kids about the importance of bees, teach them they don't have to be scared. Um, here's some really great sources. Um, yeah, and um, I think the best books I've highlighted here, um, the Xerxes Society, Attracting Native Pollinators is one of the very first books that I read. Um, yeah. And I actually um, really like the recent Frankie and Robin Clark book as well. Um, and just so you know, Douglas, I read your book like at the very beginning of my research back in 2009, and I loved it. So that was recommended to me by Ellen Zagri in the UC Davis Arboretum. So thank you. Um, yeah, and um, these are what the titles look like. Recently, there's been a new book published, which is excellent, um, by Brian Danforth. And I think that it's a very, it's a very easy to read book um, to understand better bee biology and how that plays out, and about the individual um, bee genera and um, <coughs> what they need to survive. And the cover has this adorable um, bee with its legs. Woo! <laughs> um, also, there's this great website run by me. Shameless plug! BeeLandscapes.com. You can check it out. I published a lot of my pictures uh, from my research on the website. Uh, feel free to download them, use them. Just please put my name on there. Um, send people my way. And um, you can email me here. And thank you very, very much for the opportunity.